everyone. Still morning, I think, in Michigan at least. My name is Holger Neubauer. I'm the preacher from the Church of Christ at Lakeshore in South Haven, Michigan. We meet at the corner of County Road 380 and M140 every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We have a Wednesday night Bible study at 6 p.m. We have a radio program that broadcasts every Sunday morning from Southwest Michigan on Cozy Radio 103.7 at 9 a.m. And that stretches all the way from Grand Rapids on the west coast of Michigan all the way to uh, Holland, Kalamazoo, down to South Bend, Indiana. So we've got a large swath of the community that we can reach. And so if you have any, uh, you have any interest in um, following up from something uh, that I have said or that uh, anything that the church is presenting, you can call me at 269-325-4449. And as we get into the lesson today, talk about the death of Christ and how it related to the death of Adam, I want to tell you about my book, Maranatha. It is an Aramaic word, which is found in the Syriac, Peshitta, the Aramaic Syrian translation of the Old Testament scriptures, which the Jews were uh, familiar with, which is in the context of coming quickly to the temple, and that's the very word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22, and that is the coming of the Lord that the Corinthians were yearning for, looking forward to, in order that the new world might be established, that they could commune with his presence, and that the persecution of that old age would end, and all, of course, the religious leaders at Corinth who were causing the persecution allowed to by Rome would have gone to Jerusalem for that last Passover feast, and consequently that persecution would have been over, uh, Jesus having destroyed the man of sin, 666 man who is the high priest, and that's all in my book. If you would like a copy, you can reach out to me on Facebook, send me your address and I'll send you a copy for free and uh, if you want to help out that's up to you but uh, you can have the copy for free. Well I want to talk to you today about the death of Christ as it related to overcoming the death of Adam and as we consider the payment for sin through Christ we want to notice something as we begin the lesson today. That in Exodus chapter 21, we find that God requires equal payment for sin. And that is that the payment for sin has to equal the transgression itself. And so life is demanded for life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, wound for wound, burning for burning, stripe for stripe. Equal payment for every transgression. And of course, the wages of sin is death. And Jesus has to pay the penalty in every regard. So we are going to look into Adam's transgression and to understand the nature of his death. And of course, Adam and Eve are both in the Garden of Eden, and they were given every tree in the garden to eat. It was good for food. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and verse 9. Now here's a question to begin with. If Adam was made human, fully human, the way you and I are fully human, and he had a biological body, just like you and I have, we have a biological body, and every tree was good for food, then if Adam would not have eaten of all of the trees that were good for food, what would have happened to his biological existence? Well, he would have died. You see, the flesh and blood part, which cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 
was not designed to live forever and ever. The Bible clearly says, then shall the dust return to the dust and the spirit to God who gave it. But when would the dust return to the dust and the spirit to God who gave it? Well, ultimately, everyone who dies, physically, biologically, his physical existence ends at that particular point. But his spirit will return to God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, there is a judgment that took place in order that the spirit might return unto God. Now, as we look again at Adam, we affirm that he was made in a body of flesh and blood just the way you and I experience this life, in a physical reality. And yet the Lord told Adam he was to eat of the trees that were in the garden because they were good for food. So he made him with biological urges, just the way that you and I are made. But God warned him not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for you shall not eat of that tree. In the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So Adam was warned in the day that he would eat, he would truly die. And of course, when he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, something immediate took place. Immediately they understood that they were naked. And so in their shame, they go to hide their shame and they make garments. And they made these kind of loin claws that covered their extremities, and then God clothed them with the skins of animal, animals. Well, the result of what Adam and Eve did took place the day they ate. They came in a kind of awareness. They understood that they were naked. They covered up. They experienced shame for the first time. They died. And though the physical tree had spiritual consequences to it, so too the tree of life. Physical tree with spiritual consequences to live with God and to stay in his presence. And the tree of life, by the way, is restored in Revelation chapter 22, which was given for the nations and their healing. And we'll get to that in a moment. And so I'm not denying that there were physical realities with the tree that they ate of or in the tree of life but i'm affirming that they had spiritual consequences now adam was told by god in the day he would eat he would die he ate he died that very day and someone says well he died spiritually he began to die biologically that day i think that's nonsense the Bible doesn't say that. It says in the day that he would eat thereof, he would truly die. In Genesis 5 and verse 5, Adam died when he was a full 930 years old. Now the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, it is therefore set in the hearts of men fully to do evil. And so, if God does not kill Adam, and he doesn't die, the very, die he, uh, the very day he ate, he would have violated his own standard of righteousness. Because Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 tells us that the sons of men, if they wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for their punishment, it just makes matters worse. God didn't violate his own standard. He did exactly what he said he would do. Adam died in the day that he ate. And someone says, well, at that time the earth was cursed, and the ground was cursed, and uh, also Eve was cursed. Well, the Bible teaches that we will not die for our parents' sins. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. So 
You do not have the Son who bears the iniquity of the Father. You don't have the Father that bears the iniquity of the Son. You have that principle in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16 as well. God is punishing Adam for his own sin. It's his ground that is cursed. That is the land that Adam himself will work upon. That was the consequence of what he did. And also Eve's sin had her own personal consequence. Women are not still suffering in child pain in an aggravated way because of Eve. Hers was aggravated. Yes, there are birth pangs. But it was Eve's that were um, multiplied. Eve's pains became greater for her, for her individual sin. And even if you're going to argue that the ground, the rocks, the trees, the birds, and the bees were all cursed because of Adam's sin, you've got a problem with Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. Where the Bible says, at the sacrifice of Noah, that the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy everything as I have done. So he's never going to curse the ground for man's sake again. And he's never going to destroy every living thing as I have done. And of course, I know the standard argument. Well, he did it by water. He's going to do it by fire next time. No, that's not what he says at all. The fiery end of 2 Peter chapter 3 has reference to the fall of the temple. It's Hebrew hyperbole. There are three sets of heavens and earth in 2 Peter chapter 3, and not one of them have reference to cirrus clouds and rocks and dirt. They have reference to systems. There's a heaven and earth in Noah's time. There's a heaven and earth which is now. That's the Jewish age. And the one that was hasting, the new heaven and the new earth, is of Revelation 21 and 22, which is simply a fulfillment of the prophecies and a picture of the new heavens, the new earth, which in fact is the new age in which the church is manifest, the kingdom is manifest. That's what that is all about. So we find that in Genesis 8 and verse 21, God promises never again to curse the earth. So, Adam dies, and he dies the very day he sinned. And that's exactly what Romans chapter 5 teaches. That the death that Adam died was passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Listen carefully what Paul has to say. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Well, what is sin? Transgression of the law. This is not only the law of Moses, because all sinned, and he's speaking about Adam's death to Moses. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses because they violated God's law. Even in patriarchy, it was law that was violated, which brought forward death. So Adam dies the day he ate, spiritually, separated from God. That's what death is. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, you're dead in trespasses and sins. Paul said, I was alive once without the law. The commandment came, sin revived, I died. And so death, due to sin, has a spiritual component to it. And it is God who determines life and death. And someone who is in an unforgiven state is dead and trespasses in sins. And we have to come into a relationship of life through Christ in order to live before God. And so the death that Adam died was spiritual in nature. He died the day he ate. And it was the devil who said, you will not truly die. Now, who are you going to believe? I think we ought to believe God, that in the day that Adam ate, he would die. 
And so then death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Now, was there universal salvation at the cross? No, I don't think so. The free gift of salvation came by means of the cross, but not at the cross. The gospel is the means by which salvation is obtained, and that gospel would be completed at the time that the temple fell. So now we find that as Adam introduces sin, death passes upon all men, for all have sin. Sin's transgression of the law, 1 John 3, verse 4. So this must be a spiritual death in Romans 5, verse 12, because it is due to men and their own sin. So we sin and we die like Adam did. He sinned and he died and uh, died, which is spiritual in its nature. Again, Paul said, I was alive once without the law. The commandment came, sin revived, I died. He's dead, spiritually. Again, Ephesians 2, 1, you're dead in trespasses and sins. So death passes to all men, for all have sinned. What is sin? Transgression of the law. He's talking about spiritual death. And he's talking about how one man's righteous act, through what he did, and through the gift of salvation, all men could obtain life. But that's a choice. Just like sin is a choice. They're not inheriting this death. They're choosing the death of their federal head. In Adam, we're human. We're weak. We sin and we die. In Christ, we can obey and we can live. Because he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And that's what 1 Corinthians 15, 22 means. In Adam all die. In Christ all shall be made alive. It's the same thing. Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 address the same issue of death. We're talking about death of covenant, not biological death. We're talking about a covenant that could not bring life, and that's the old covenant uh, of death. Now, Adam sins and dies the day he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He died that day. He's outside of God's presence. To be outside of God's presence, his house, his temple is death. That's why in Luke chapter 15 and verse 24, when the prodigal came back from his rebellion and he was offered uh, to live in the father's house again because he had forsaken his sinful lifestyle, the father said to the elder son, my son who is dead is alive again. He's dead outside of the Father's presence. He's alive inside the Father's presence and in his house. And outside of the house of God, his church, his tabernacle, there's death. Inside, there is life. Now, the death that Christ dies has to equal the death introduced by Adam. And so Christ, of course, dies in a biological manner. And I'm not minimizing that death one sliver or in one iota. Jesus lived under the law. And under the law, there were many crimes that were punished with immediate biological death. And in those crimes and transgressions in which they died in a biological manner, Jesus had to die for those crimes as well, to redeem us from the law. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, For we find in the fullness of time Christ came, born under the law, to redeem them who were under the law. And so the law demanded physical biological punishment and death, stripes and death. 
Jesus endures the stripes and the death, the biological death, to redeem Old Covenant Israel from the law. Now, sin, however, has a spiritual component as well. And that is when an individual sins and dies, and he is separated from God, spiritually, like Adam was. And again, the law came and was added there because of transgressions. The law didn't help the circumstance. It exasperated the circumstance and manifested sin. Paul would say, how had I known lust, except the law say, thou shalt not covet. So whereas Adam died when he ate, before he covered it, I think I said in the last uh, video, um, I think I said it in an opposite way. So before Adam um, ate, he obviously coveted. Well, he didn't die at covetousness. He died when he ate, right? So, but there was no law regarding covetousness directly related to Adam at that time. What the law did was to manifest the sin of the heart. So Paul would say, how had I known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. And he died when he lusted, when he coveted. Okay? And so the death that he died. Adam died the day that he sinned, and he died spiritually. And the death that Jesus dies has to overcome that death. And the death that Jesus dies is no doubt biological because he's redeeming from the law. But again, there's a spiritual component in sin that is manifest today by the gospel. But we don't punish individuals biologically today, do we? No. Well, if biological death was the punishment for sin, then the church should punish individuals in a biological way. They should give stripes and they should torture just the way that the Catholics did during the Inquisition, which is a consequence, by the way, of original sin. If there's no original sin, that there's no original death. And we don't inherit spiritual death. We don't inherit biological death. Uh, death from sin, biological death would have taken place whether Adam sinned or not. It's not what caused his death. Sin caused his death, and he died the day he sinned. So the question is, did Christ die spiritually? And this is where my our opponents, mine in particular, have uh, argued that I have somehow blasphemed, in which I have suggested that Christ died spiritually. Well, we've had lots of brethren that affirm that. They haven't called that heresy until some of us, some of us began to preach the second coming of Christ taking place at the fall of the temple and setting forth the spiritual reality of life, where Jesus said, if you live and believe in me, you will never die, John eleven forty six. 46. Not until then did they oppose us in the way that they have here recently. Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, Paul says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. Now, how had all died? Were all men biologically dead at the time that Paul wrote? I don't think so. Everyone was dead in trespasses and sins without Christ. That's what Paul affirms the Ephesians, both Jew and Gentile. You're dead in trespasses. They're dead in sins. And so Christ gives life. But he has to pay the penalty for sin. Well, when did he pay the penalty for sin? He paid the penalty on the cross. And that's where he paid the penalty. That's where he died in spirit. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, we find that the penalty for sin was to be paid upon the tree. 
And so, Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. Of course, this is the event that Paul cites in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. He was there hanging upon the tree. Where did he pay the penalty? Upon the tree. All right. So Christ pays the penalty for sin on the tree. Now there are seven sayings of Christ on the cross. He begins with the term Father. Forgive them for they know not what they do. He ends with the prayer, Father, receive my spirit. And so everything which transpires on the cross, or the stake of Christ, actually. You might want to look up the word cross and find that's the Greek word stauros, stake. Vines has an interesting uh, remark about the cross. He points out that the Babylonian god Tammuz was worshipped for centuries by pagans. And there was actually a tea that the pagans honored uh, Tammuz with the uh, feminine god was Ishtar. And the state church, which would become the Catholics, of course, the universal church, couldn't remove the pagans from the, from the tea, and so they brought it down for a cross. It appears that Jesus simply died on the tree or the stake, and his hands were crossed over his head and feet were crossed. I think that's probably where the idea came from. But nevertheless, it, it was on the tree that he died. So for the three hours of darkness, Christ is now paying the penalty for sin. Now, does God require equal payment for equal transgression? Yes. Therefore, Christ has to die in spirit. And someone says, well, he becomes a sinner. No, he takes the burden of sin upon him and dies in spirit, and there pays the penalty for sin, which is spiritual in its nature. The law certainly demonstrated that there was a biological element to it, because under the law, you had to be punished biologically. But we're not punished biologically in the church for sin today, are we? Are adulterers withdrawn from, or are they stoned? All right, there's a penalty, but it's spiritual, social in its nature, not biological. Individuals steal today? Is there punishment? Of course. Do we have the same punishment of the Old Testament? Of course not. So it's spiritual in its nature, you see. And so in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, Christ pays the penalty. He dies. If one died for all, then all died. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, he who made him, who knew no sin to be, uh, and he who made him, who knew no sin, uh, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So he becomes the penalty for sin, that we could be redeemed by Christ. So yes, he dies in spirit. However, he pays the penalty on the tree. And so relationship with God is intact by the fact that he calls upon God the Father to begin with on the cross. And at the end, he says, Father, receive my spirit because the payment for sin was made. Now, Jesus goes to the cross in honor of the Father on our behalf. And so while on the cross, he pays the penalty for sin. There he pays the penalty for sin. So he's not out of relationship with God when he dies. And again, Hades is not the punishment for sin. It's the result of sin that is not yet completely forgiven. So the righteous have to go to Hades. Jesus then goes to Hades, overcomes Hades, dies on the cross, suffers the consequence of that death, 
goes to Hades with a covenant people, overcomes it through resurrection because he was sinless, whereas whereby he becomes the first person in the new covenant, and he becomes the chief cornerstone of the new temple that was about to be built. And that new uh, temple that was going to be built, Christ being the chief cornerstone, isn't built at Pentecost. It, be it begins to be built, but it doesn't have any Gentiles in it for 12 years. It has spiritual gifts for 40. It doesn't have elders for 8, and on and on we could go. It doesn't appear that the uh, rule for the contribution on the first day of the week was set till 1 Corinthians 16 and verses 1 and 2, which was uh, 58 A.D., which we're talking about uh, 25 years after Pentecost. So the church is being built. The kingdom is increasing, like three measures of meal. Judea, Samaria, the othermost parts of the world. It's increasing. It's growing. The church is growing. It's being revealed. And soon the revelation uh, of, the, of the true tabernacle of God that came along with the revelation of Christ. It's the building of the church. That's what it's all about. So, Christ dies in spirit, paying the penalty upon the cross. And my opponents uh, suggest somehow uh, this violates the inclusio argument that I made. No. Christ begins with a relationship. He ends with a relationship. Everything in between is about how he gave himself suffering on our behalf in order to restore relationship. That's what it's about. So my opponents who are making videos every time uh, I make a video, you, need, you guys need to do a little bit better job in following me because you're not doing a very good job at all. Um, and you're not following my argumentation very well. Jesus died in spirit, if he did not, then in fact, there's not a true penalty for sin. The Bible says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and are of a contrite heart. Psalm 55, 17. Let me say that again. The sacrifices of God are of a contrite heart and a broken spirit. Christ had to be broken in spirit, broken for us, in order to have sin's penalty paid. Now, you remember Paul said that his body was broken for us in 1 Corinthians 11. Well, the Bible says in John chapter 19, not a bone of his was to be broken. And so the answer generally is, well, it's the five punctured wounds that actually broke the body of Christ. No, that's not the idea at all. He was broken in his relationship. He was broken first for Israel, for the two bodies of Israel and Judah, to gather them back together. And he would do so through a new covenant. And as the northern tribe, tribes had lost their identity among the Gentiles, they had to come in just like the Gentiles, those who did not have the uh, covenant of circumcision. So, Christ dies for the world, for the Jews and for the Gentile. And he's broken in half. His body, his identity is broken on our behalf. And we remember that he suffered all alone on the cross. And then the sacrifice was accepted. And again, I want you all to think about this. Did Christ suffer for eternity for sins? No then that must not be the penalty for sins. I'm not denying judgment. I'm not denying punishment. I'm denying the religious world's infatuation with the Catholic concepts of torture for billions and billions and billions of years. The Bible says that God will not retain his anger forever. Micah 7, 18. It's for a moment. Joel chapter 2. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 4 and also verse 27, God promised Judah that he would burn them forever and the palaces would be burned forever. The consequences are forever. That's true. That's not how uh, the term is used, however, in the sense that we're using it in modern parlance. And so we need to do a little bit better job in understanding exactly 
what God means by everlasting. The consequences of life are everlasting, and someone dies, that consequence is everlasting as well. That's the idea. So, uh, and by the way, uh, my brethren, what they ought to do on occasion is to go look at Matthew 10, 28 in regard to Isaiah 10, 18. And let my brothers open their hearts in an honest way and investigate and compare the scriptures. Jesus is a Jewish prophet using Jewish language about a Jewish judgment in Matthew 10, 28. And in that context, he said, you shall not come over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And that's the time that the old covenant body would be thrown into the valley of Hinnom, Get Earth, Hinnom, uh, valley, Jeremiah 7, 31, 32, and the body would be extinguished, and that's what he means there. So, let's get back to the death of Christ. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, thus if one died for all, then all died. That must be spiritual in its nature. If Christ did not die in spirit, we don't have a whole payment for sin. And, of course, Christ pays for sin. And he pays with his life in spirit. And someone says, well, you know, the physical body of Christ suffered for sin. Physical blood was shed. Of course, physical blood was shed. Absolutely. It's a requirement of the law. However, what does the phrase, the shedding of blood, mean? In Proverbs 6 and verse 17, the Bible says one of the things that the Lord hates is the shedding of innocent blood. Does that mean when we find an innocent child and we poke him and the blood comes out that God hates that? Well, I'm sure we're not suggesting anyone should poke a child or poke a person and uh, poke him in order that, uh, you know, that blood can come out. But they, you know, doctors poke little babies in order to get a blood sample, don't they? Is that the concept? He hates that? No. The shedding of innocent blood means the taking of life. When Jesus shed his blood, he gave his life. And that blood was offered in heaven. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. It was offered in heaven. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place. Now how did he do that? He gave his life as an offering. What was the demonstration that he gave off? Of course he shed his biological blood. Of course he was broken uh, in a physical way. But the question is, did that take away sin? That took away the curse of the law. But I'm not under the law of Moses. You're not under the law of Moses. So where's your sacrifice for sins today? It's got to be in a spiritual covenant because Christ died in spirit for us, creating a new kind of body, spiritual body, which is the church, creating a new kind of tabernacle, spiritual tabernacles of church, that God could dwell with us in full forgiveness. And when did he do that? In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, the tabernacle of God is with us. So I want to, again, emphasize what I have been saying. Adam de uh, died the day he ate. He would have died biologically whether he sinned or not because the flesh and blood part is not designed to live forever. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. Christ removed us from the curse of Adam. And that curse is because we are weak in Adam. We sin and we die just like he sinned and he died. And we die the very day we sin. So when we grow up, we pass the threshold of accountability, we lust just like Paul did, and we die today. The gospel is now the standard, the instrument of judgment. Covetousness is still wrong. But under the law, there was no real provision for forgiveness. Today, we repent, we're baptized, we're made new in Christ, where we will never die. 
Jesus said, if you live and believe in me, you will never die. I'm pretty sure that's spiritual, right? Well, what provides our spiritual life? Christ, who has been made a life-giving spirit. He died. He was made alive in spirit. And that's exactly what Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So through his death, his burial, and resurrection, and their spiritual significance to all of those events, not simply dying in a biological way, not simply being buried in a biological way, and not simply being raised in a biological way. All of those things took place, but there were signs of a greater reality. The Bible says the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. When did he become a life-giving spirit? At his resurrection, you see, at his resurrection. And so uh, Christ then, who overcomes the grave, he dies for sin. He is raised out of Hades. He cleanses Hades, by the way, with his presence. That's when I think they're all given white robes. And they were waiting then for their full redemption. And so in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, we find that they were asking the question, the dead martyrs, how long, how long would it be? And God says, yet for a little while. It's the same phrase in Hebrews 10, 37. He was coming in a very, very little while for their justification. And so it is Christ that gives spiritual life. And again, your biology has nothing to do with redemption. The body that was referred to in the New Testament that was being redeemed is simply the church. It was given the promise of redemption through the miraculous working of the Spirit for 40 years. And then that body would be transformed. It would be changed. And then at the seventh trump, uh, the last trump, we find that resurrection would take place, just like the witnesses were to take place. Uh, the, the, be raised in Revelation chapter 11, come up here, Revelation 11, 12. You remember that? That was at resurrection. And so I'll get into these other uh, concepts a little bit um, later. Remember again, uh, we were starting with the death of Adam. We are responding how the death of Christ would take place and take care of that sin. And again, Isaiah 30, uh, 53 verse 10, I don't think that I remembered to give you this verse earlier. His soul was made as a sacrifice for sins. You see, it was not the biology of Christ that ultimately paid for sins. It was Christ's sinless spirit. And it's the spirit of man that needs to be redeemed, not his biological body. Your biological body does not harbor sin. The rocks, the trees, and the birds, and the bees don't harbor sin. The physical world procures its own purposes to demonstrate the glory of God. Well, how could it demonstrate the glory of God? How could the heavens and the earth demonstrate the glory of God? Psalm 19.1, heavens and the earth show the the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, um, night unto night, uh, show his speech, day unto day knowledge, no uh, voice or language where they are not heard. How can the physical world declare the glory of God if it's all affected by sin to where we can't see clearly? No. The physical world procures the purposes of God. Our plants have not been tainted by sin. Now, they may have put some chemicals in those plants. That may have tainted them. But sin hasn't done that. And it may be wrong for a uh, company to put poison in the earth. That's another matter altogether. We're talking to, uh, about since Adam. When Adam sinned, did the plants all wilt? When Adam sinned, was the water all tainted? When Adam sinned, was the entire world with its flowers, did they get a little bit uh, dimmer? No, brethren. These are things which the world commonly believes, which is just false. It's not true. The kind of redemption that Jesus restored is spiritual in its nature so that we will never die. Let me answer a few questions here. Uh, 
how do we balance continued study while ignoring tribes, nations, earth, meaning ancient Israel, and making us curious about Jesus being the prophet Messiah for only Israel? Let me just say this about this idea of Israel only. In Acts chapter 7, we find, in verse 45, that when Joshua came into the land, he took it from the Gentiles. He brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, the nations. All right. When the northern tribes lost their identity in uh, Jacob and in Israel, they then were assimilated among the Gentiles. They even lost the covenant of circumcision, which was given to the fathers. So in the book of Galatians, when they're considering circumcision for their commitment to God, if they were truly Israel, Abraham's descendants, they should have been circumcised. But they shouldn't be circumcised because they're not under that covenant. And they were made perfect by a covenant of the spirit, not of the flesh. Whereas the Jews began in the flesh, the Galatians started in the spirit. And so the uh, Gentiles of the New Testament have with them the lost diaspora who had lost their identity and others who had no identity whatsoever. And they all needed the gospel in order to be saved. So when Jesus dies for Israel, the two bodies coming together, it involved those who had lost their identity altogether with the law and with Abraham. So that's the answer. And I'm not going to go on and on and on and on with I.O. The Israel-only movement, and I don't think there are hardly any Israel-only folk that have come from restoration background in churches of Christ. I think they're all Calvinists. Because Calvinism is an evil. And if someone wants to debate me in a public way on original sin and Calvinism, I will debate them any day of the week. It is wrong to the core. And it is Calvinism that's caused the problem in the religious world to begin with. And it's Calvinism that leads to I.O. And of course, uh, if Calvinism is false, then their doctrine is false, which it is, uh, by the way. So um, that's enough for today. I appreciate uh, your interest in these things. If you have any um, uh, questions, you can contact me on Facebook. Again, if you would like a copy of my book, Maranatha, I'll send you one. Just contact me on Facebook with your address, and I'll make sure you get one. All right. May God bless your studies. We pray that the Father gives us a sense of insight as we prayerfully go to God, looking at his will, carefully reasoning, and recognizing that we are to be absolutely and brutally honest in all of our conclusions.